Let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this new opportunity to gather as your people, to spend some time in your word, to sing your praises. And Lord, we invite you to be present here among your people. Pour out your spirit on us, on this place. Fill us, open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes that we may see you. Open our ears that we may hear you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're continuing our uh, series on, which I've titled Big Deal, uh, because you, you sometimes wonder, as, as we watch the world around us, as we read the headlines, as we see often a lot of uh, the, the, the big and, in many cases, terrible events that happen throughout our world, are tied to some extent, to, to what people believe. And in some cases, to their faith in, in some God or other. And you wonder, what is the big deal about religion? And for us, the big deal is God himself. God is the big deal. And so we have been looking a little more uh, intentionally at uh, at the exi very existence of God. And we, we looked at uh, how the very nature itself, the, the creation, that, that world in which we live just screams out for a creator. And, and as the creator of all things, last week we looked at the fact that since God created all things, all things are under his power and his authority because they came from him. They are his. We are his. And along with, with the sovereignty of God comes today's topic, the law of God. Now, to be honest, as human beings, we have kind of this, this love-hate relationship with, with rules. I mean, perhaps you've had this sort of an experience where you are, are driving on 95 at... Uh, well, let's just say something above the posted speed, lim speed limit. And you're thinking, well, it's okay because, you know, I'm moving with the flow of traffic. Everybody's doing it. If I were to slow down, I'd, I would just be in people's way. So I'm just, I'm just moving along. And, and I've actually had this thought. I, I, I look at, I'm really not passing anybody, and other people are still passing me, so I must be okay. And then that person blows by you, and you're looking at your speedometer, and you're thinking, okay, I'm already, however miles it is, over the speed limit, and they went by me like I'm standing still. Where are the cops when you need them? <laughs> you see, we, we like rules for other people. If you're into sports, you know when, when your team is penalized, you scream at the TV, come on, ref, what are you, blind? But then when the other team doesn't get called on some penalty, it's the same thing. What's wrong with you, ref? Are you blind? We, we like other people to obey the rules, and, and that's really part of it. I mean, I'm sure none of you have ever cheated in, in a card game or, or anything like that. But it really only works if everybody else is following the rules of the game. If everybody's cheating, then the whole game just devolves into chaos. But if everybody else follows the rules, then you can cheat effectively. So we, we like rules for other people. And actually, if you think about it, in, in science, now we talked a little bit about science the, the first week, <coughs> but science only works if there are certain laws, the law of gravity, various laws in physics, but you see, 
in order to study creation, in order to study the world around it, there, there have to be laws. You, you have to be, that you, that you can observe and you can repeat. Because if there weren't such laws, science would be unable to study. If everything was truly chaotic and truly random, there would be no way to really study it. But there are laws. This, this world was created with order. In fact, right in the beginning of Genesis, it talks about the fact that the world was formless and void. It was chaotic. And God created order. Laws. But we don't really like people telling us what to do. In fact, our society is is kind of built on this, this concept that, that we are free to do whatever we want. That, that we can do what we want, when we want, with who we want, whenever we want. But we also recognize, to some extent, that when somebody else is doing whatever they want with whoever they want, whenever they want, it sometimes impinges on our freedom. It gets in our way. That's why we like rules to apply to, to other people, to keep them out of our way so we can do what we want. But that's not the way it works. We need we need guidelines. We need, we need limits. In fact, we recognize that. I mean, that, that's why we have rules to games. It, the game would be no fun if there were no rules. We wouldn't know how to win. How, how do you score points? How, we, we need them in order for the game to be fun. And yet, we like to pretend that we are limitless, that we can do whatever we want. And I think we find, for some reason, the law of God to be restrictive. And for some reason, we seem to think and to have this concept that somehow God is trying to keep us from something good. That he's trying to keep us from pleasure, from fun. When in fact, his laws are set up to protect us. I mean, think, think of, of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are placed in this garden, this beautiful garden, where they're there is no sin yet. And they are told, you can eat from anything in the garden except this one tree. Now, it would be one thing, and it might even be cruel if they had, if they had nothing to eat except for this one tree, and they're told, you, you, sorry, you can't eat from that. But they have an abundance of choices. They have everything they could possibly need. But there's one thing they are told they're not allowed to have. And somehow it is just our human nature that when we are set a limit, we just feel this need to exceed that limit. Okay, we have all of this stuff, but there's got to be something special about that tree. I mean, sure, we've got plenty to eat, but what is it about, about the fruit on that tree that just looks so tempting? We don't like limits. 
And yet, we need them. And in the scripture that Beth just shared with us from Deuteronomy, it even tells us that God gave us these for our own good. Not for evil, not to be punitive, not to keep us from having fun, but to keep us from harm, to keep us from hurting one another. And really, that's what God's law is all about. In fact, Jesus simplifies the whole law for us. In Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So there's, there's no question here. I mean, the Pharisees see an opportunity and they gather together and they huddle and they, they discuss and they decide, okay, how are we going to corner Jesus this time? And so they pick one of their experts in the law and they send him uh, on their behalf to question Jesus, to, to trick him, to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? So they are asking Jesus. Now, they don't seem to realize this, but they're actually asking God, the one who wrote the law to begin with. Okay, out of the whole law, which is the, really the most important of the laws? And Jesus said to him, without hesitation, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. So Jesus said, okay, if you're going to if you're going to pin me down here, the most important law for you to follow is to love God, to love God with all that you are, your whole being, to just love God. That's the first and the greatest commandment. But there's a second part to it. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you see, that's a little more difficult. Now, loving God, we can kind of do that in the privacy of our own mind. Oh, sure, I love God. Oh, absolutely. And how is anybody going to prove you wrong? But if as part of that love of God, you also have to love those people around you. You have to treat them with the same honor and respect and care that you would want them to treat you with. Well, that's a little bit easier to see. We can say we love God. But if we aren't loving one another, if we're not loving other people in this world around us, then are we really sure we love God? But then he goes on to make a remarkable statement in verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now remember, when Jesus was ministering, when all of these events in the New Testament were happening, the only Bible that any of them had was the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. The New Testament hadn't yet been written. And Jesus is saying that all of the Old Testament, the whole Law, all of the prophets, everything that they said, all the words that, from God that they spoke to the people, all of that hangs on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all that you are 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you look at the Ten Commandments, it's fairly easy to see. The first four deal with loving God. The last six deal with loving your neighbor. However, as the Pharisees kind of showed us, you can pretty much keep the law without actually loving anybody. If you just make it a checklist, okay, well, I haven't coveted anybody's property today. I haven't committed adultery today. Uh, I haven't stolen anything today. But you see, that misses the point. The point is that we are not just to not do certain things. We are to actually care about our neighbors. We're, we're to care about those people around us. We're, we're to look out for them. We're to love them, not because they are lovable. See, because there is, there's the interesting thing. We are really not one of us worthy of God's love. There is no reason that God ought to love us. I mean, we generally do everything in our power to disobey Him, to reject Him, to find other things to pay attention to. And yet, he loves us. And yet, He came for us. And yet, He died for us. And so, we have no excuse. We cannot look at anyone else in this world and say, they're not worthy of my love. Them, I can skip. Okay, I'll be nice to these people over here, but these people, forget about it. Because God loved you regardless of who you were, where you came from, what you've done. In fact, He came knowing exactly who you are and where you've been and what you've done and what you think about And he died on the cross to pay the penalty for all of that stuff. And he asks us to love him and to love those around us. And that means being patient and kind. Not putting oneself first, but putting others ahead of yourself. Not being boastful or envious or arrogant or rude. Rejoicing when others are successful. And encouraging those who have not yet been successful. We are called to love because we have been loved first. That's really the law. That's what God asks of us. And if you read this book, and I, I know there are sections of it that are hard to just plow through. And there are sections that you think, what on earth does this mean? Well, according to Jesus, if you read this book and you come up with any interpretation other than love God and love your neighbor, you're wrong. Because that's what he said. This whole thing hangs on those two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. 
oh, the angels are singing. <laughs> <clears throat> love God and love your neighbor. It doesn't seem like that ought to be that difficult. And yet most of you are thinking right now, well, yeah, except you don't know my neighbor. And I probably don't know your neighbor, but I know my neighbors. And I will grant you, some of them are hard to love. But I also grant you that at least for some people, I am probably very hard to love. Thankfully, my wife is not here to corroborate that <laughs> this morning. But we are called to love one another. Because that is how we show that we also love God. And so if we're not doing one, we're probably not doing the other. And God, God is the one who created you. He knows the potential that you have. He knows that it is hard. But here's the key to this whole thing. Here's, here's the key to the whole Christian walk. We can't do it on our own. And God doesn't ask us to do it on our own. God is not stupid. He is the one who created us. He knows that we are not capable, but he offers his Holy Spirit to fill us, to empower us, to enable us to do that which he has called us to do. So he doesn't send us out on our own he goes with us to help us to love even those that we think are unlovable. Because we were once there. In fact, some of us may still think that we are unlovable. So I hope that if that is you, you hear today that God loves you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. And those of us who will allow God's Spirit to work in us and through us love you too. Let us pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that despite our flaws, despite the things that we have done uh, that displease you, despite the fact that we have run from you at times, despite the fact that we reject you uh, many times, the fact that, that we find it hard sometimes to even admit that we believe in you, you still have loved us. You have come for us. You have, you have given yourself for us. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Strengthen us that we might go out into your world to love others, to proclaim your love for them, that we might bring others into a loving relationship with their creator. For that, that is what you call us to do. So help us to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen.